Caleb, are you ready? That's all I'll ever be. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Cool. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Caleb Smith. Uh, I am a master's candidate in public policy here at Stanford. It's my distinct pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you for coming. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how uh, the city of Oakland, California uh, can help uh, its residents uh, afford the construction of accessory dwelling units as a means to help alleviate uh, the city's affordable housing shortage. Um, so my client for this project uh, was the office of Mayor Libby Schaff, uh, the mayor of Oakland. Um, so I was working with her staff uh, as I was developing uh, this project. Uh, and I was based, what I was looking for was based on their uh, search criteria. Uh, now, before we get uh, too far along in our presentation today, uh, I should probably describe what an accessory dwelling unit is, uh, because it may not necessarily be uh, second nature to everyone here today. Uh, an accessory dwelling unit, also known as an in-law unit, uh, or a granny flat, or if you're Canadian, a laneway house, uh, is uh, uh, an apartment unit which has its own uh, bathroom, kitchen, and entrance and exit, uh, which is located on the same lot as a single family home. Um, so, uh, in this diagram uh, from the city of St. Paul, uh, we see the main kinds of accessory dwelling units, or ADUs as I'll call them today. Uh, we see that they can be within a house, often uh, those will be uh, basement conversions, um, sometimes garage conversions are another common kind, uh, and then also um, another common kind of ADUs is when someone takes a separate outbuilding, uh, builds a separate outbuilding, uh, like a cottage or a tiny house, and sites that in, say, the backyard. Um, so these are the main kinds of accessory dwelling units. Uh, something it's good to keep in mind these different kinds of ADUs because some of the different financing options that we're going to be talking about for Oakland homeowners today are going to work better or worse for some of these different kinds of designs. There's also substantial cost differential uh, between these different kinds of units um, where one kind of ADU might cost half as much as another kind of ADU. Um, so, um, uh, talking a little bit, uh, before I get into uh, the question of uh, why we need to be looking uh, for more financing options, it's good for us to talk about why ADUs are so interesting to the mayor's office and to a lot of folks in the affordable uh, housing community. Uh, the short answer is they're cheap. Um, uh, uh, if we were to look at the cost of building a new multifamily uh, apartment unit in San Francisco, which is the best comparative information I was able to find, the estimate clocks in at about $400,000. Uh, there's a big asterisk attached to the studio uh, apartment estimate. I wasn't able to find a good market rate estimate. Uh, however, if you were to say look at Zillow, you'll also be looking at at least $400,000 for a studio apartment to buy one in Oakland. Um, so this is just a, a little bit of a more careful estimate. On the other hand, building an ADU, uh, based on the Turner Center at Berkeley's uh, comprehensive study of ADU construction uh, on the West Coast uh, suggests that the average cost in high cost cities is about maybe $156,000, uh, which is considerably less than the multifamily unit. And if we were to focus on basement ADU conversions, which uh, talking with the experts are generally perceived to be the cheapest of ADU uh, construction types, we could be looking at as little as $80,000, uh, even in high cost cities, which is a fifth of what we'd be looking at for a comparable multifamily building. Um, so uh, this is a considerable uh, opportunity to create relatively low cost housing. Um, of course, it's worth noting that uh, these are relatively affordable. They're also tend to be pretty small. Um, most ADUs are either uh, studios or one bedroom apartments. It's pretty rare for them to be two bedroom or above. Um, however, still, uh, for at least one segment of affordable housing, this is a very cost efficient way to proceed. Um, uh, Perhaps we can hold questions for the end, uh, if that'd be all right? Um, cool. Uh, so uh, we are also, uh, so now before I move on to the questions of what am I looking for for the city, it's probably important to describe why isn't the market just handling this itself. Um, so there's a few uh, challenges that the current private market's having when it comes to uh, building affordable housing, uh, uh, creating these accessory dwelling units. Uh, now the good news is that we've seen a considerable increase in accessory dwelling unit construction over the past year or two. Um, what we've seen is that the city of Oakland passed an ordinance, which was later pretty much copied statewide, uh, which substantially re relaxed the permitting uh, construction requirements for ADUs. Um, well, previously you had to go through a discretionary uh, review process, which meant your neighbors could oppose your ADU construction, and you had to add new parking, and there were very strict design criteria. Those rules tended to be relaxed. So now, in Oakland, 
Uh, if you want to build an ADU, your neighbors don't have any say over it. If you meet the, if you meet the check boxes, it's automatically approved. And if you're within half a mile of transit, within a block of car share service, or if you live on a street with permit parking, you don't have to add any new parking for your ADU. And if you build an ADU in the fabric of an existing house, like say a basement conversion, even if you don't live close to transit, you still don't have to add new parking. And not adding new parking is a great way to drive down the costs of ADUs, because parking is expensive, as uh, we can appreciate. Um, so the good news is that we've seen a lot of these ADUs being added uh, recently. It's unclear if this precise number is a uh, continuing trend or just pent up demand. Um, however, based on the surveys, uh, the, the analysis that's been done by the Turner Center in Berkeley, which has been doing a lot of the leading analysis on this, uh, there are thousands of prospective ADU sites which are located uh, in Oakland uh, and then also in other cities around the Bay Area, uh, close to public transportation that are ideally suited for this kind of development. Um, so the question is, why aren't people taking full advantage of this opportunity? Uh, because you can build a very low-cost apartment and then rent it out at market rates. Um, well, the answer is that uh, it's quite difficult to arrange the financing of an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, as we'll uh, go into in a minute, uh, right now the major options for people uh, to finance an ADU is to either use a, pa a pile of cash that you already have sitting around, and even in the Bay Area, not everyone has $80,000 or $150,000 just sitting around that they can use to build these. Or, and this is perhaps the more common option, uh, is you use a home equity uh, line of credit, basically, where you borrow against your house. But to do that, you have to have significant equity. Uh, you generally have to have some income uh, to be okay borrowing risk. And you also have to have a good credit score. Uh, and in Oakland, uh, which has uh, a history of um, uh, uh, the, uh, which was pretty hard hit by the uh, economic downturn, not all homeowners will necessarily have all three of those factors to be able to access the private lending markets um, with a home equity line of credit. Um, so uh, I looked at other kinds of private lending options as part of my analysis, as I'll discuss, uh, but those are the two main options that are currently being used uh, by the people who are uh, building the uh, over 250 uh, ADUs in Oakland uh, in 2017. So, uh, yes, that's exactly what the question is. How do we find more money for folks who have a great opportunity to build an ADU, but don't necessarily have the ability to finance it on their own? Uh, now, when we were uh, looking at some of the potential options, I tried to keep a few things in mind um, in terms of like search criteria, as it were, to evaluate these alternatives on. Uh, well, the first one is we want to make sure that it's relatively low cost to the city of Oakland. The city of Oakland has a lot of other financial demands, uh, and it's difficult for them to add new programs. Uh, we also want this uh, to make sure that there's a minimum crowd out effects on other kinds of affordable housing creation, because uh, Oakland needs as much affordable housing as possible, and although ADUs might be a lower cost way of building some affordable housing, uh, it would be uh, unfortunate if this was to uh, reduce other units that are being constructed, especially if these relatively small-sized units were crowding out, say, multifamily affordable units, uh, which is uh, something that Oakland desperately needs more of. Uh, we want something that's relatively low risk to Oakland, so if the program was to collapse for whatever reason, we will want to minimize the city's financial liability. Um, and then also we want something that's flexible. So these borrowers who uh, may have impacted credit or may have not a lot of home equity um, uh, should still be able to access these programs uh, because these are the people who are being left out of the existing markets. Uh, and we also want something that can serve a variety of ADUs ideally. Um, so we're able to uh, have stuff that's in the fabric of an existing home or something that's outside so we can take full advantage of the opportunities for ADU construction. And lastly, um, despite the fact that ADUs are relatively affordable, that's relatively affordable. They still cost tens of thousands of dollars, so we need to find an option which has a lot of money attached to it. Um, so uh, the good news is that we looked at a bunch of options. I looked at a bunch of options uh, today uh, and over the past uh, several weeks and months. Um, so uh, these fit into several main buckets. Uh, the first major bucket I looked at was fairly conventional. Um, private financing options start with the private sector, as it were. Uh, so retail banking, as I mentioned previously, the great thing is the city of Oakland, there's no downside risk to it, but the problem is it's not getting the job done, as I just discussed. Um, other options is looking at more sort of institutional investments. Now, uh, a lot of banks have uh, a, what's called a community banking um, section, uh, which invests money that they have to put back into low-income communities 
uh, based on the Community Reinvestment Act, which is a federal law which says that you have to reinvest a portion of your deposits back in the communities that deposit them, basically. Um, otherwise, there's negative consequences. Um, so uh, there has been some interest um, uh, by uh, J.P. Morgan Chase in this area of ADUs as a way to possibly put in some of those money. And they've actually uh, been working with a couple of groups in the South Bay to try to develop business models. Um, but so far, that's mostly uh, a theoretical uh, framework. There's no institutional investor who's already jumping up and saying, I want to fund the ADUs right now. So if they can find a way uh, from their end, which gives them a decent rate of return and also gives them security, uh, which runs into a little bit of our obstacle because these are relatively high risk borrowers who may not have the home equity, otherwise they'd use the private markets, um, then potentially institutional investors might be interested in getting involved down the road. Uh, and then also the last uh, thing that we want to put on this note uh, is one unusual instance that I encountered in my research uh, was a partnership between the cities and the banks, more, sort of a hybrid model. Uh, and this hybrid model existed in the city of Santa Cruz, where the city of Santa Cruz uh, got a grant from a regional air quality agency, and they partnered with uh, the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union uh, to create an ADU lending program. And they, uh, as a condition of this program, the borrowers had to accept an affordability covenant to make sure that this was for affordable housing. Uh, so it sounds like a great opportunity. You've got the banks and the city working together. Um, the problem is that, uh, well, a couple problems. First problem is it didn't work so well because they were doing this at the height of the housing bubble, which meant people were getting home equity lines of credit even when they really shouldn't have been uh, a lot of the time. So when Santa Cruz was trying to shop around this affordability restricted covenant loan thing, a lot of people just simply weren't interested. Um, and the second thing is that since the financial crisis, there have been some new rules that have been put in place which make it harder potentially for some of these uh, trip difficult borrowers to get loans. So uh, the Dodd-Frank Act um, says that for uh, loans to be considered the best kind of loan, uh, which has an impact securitization and such, uh, there is uh, a maximum uh, debt to income ratio. Uh, and the problem is that in most lending products, income developed from ADUs that you're going to build in future does not count towards that income. So you're, added, so you're potentially running into those thresholds uh, which is making it hard for people to tap this private financing because of the whole Dodd-Frank uh, component there. Um, so that is uh, perhaps an unintended consequence of what generally seems to be a good law, uh, but I think we might get a little bit more uh, sneak peek at Dodd-Frank in our second presentation of the day. Uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, so yeah, so uh, this also seemed to be a little bit of a one-time thing. The city was able to put some money in because they happen to have a grant. The grant no longer exists. Uh, and I wasn't be able to find something similar. So this was an interesting model of collaboration, um, but uh, it's not necessarily something the city can run with right now. Uh, now we also want to look at some of the more federal options because everyone loves free federal dollars, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, within that, looking at two sort of sub-umbrellas, the first one is uh, lending products that are targeted at homeowners. Uh, and there's three main ones that I looked at here. Uh, the first one being the uh, Section 203K mortgages, uh, and the two other two being a couple of Fannie Mae products. And these are things that are sent through private banks or mortgage brokers directly to homeowners. So the city would not be involved in them, uh, which is great if, from a city perspective if they get the job done. The problem is they don't necessarily get the job done. Uh, so for the Section uh, 203K program, uh, it's good because it's flexible uh, in terms of uh, who qualifies and such. Um, however, uh, the downside is uh, that uh, it won't necessarily help you out with uh, the ADU uh, rehabilitation uh, fee on a certain level. I mean, it's a rehabilitation loan, um, so uh, you can't necessarily use it for new uh, ADU construction in, say, your backyard, uh, to my understanding. Um, and then also, all of these have a limit of $680,000 per loan, uh, which unfortunately won't get you a lot of house these days uh, in Oakland, uh, in many neighborhoods. So uh, if you also wanted to like, put in an ADU as part of that, then uh, you might have difficulty even securing alone. Um, and then uh, for the other two things, um, there, the two Fannie Mae products are somewhat similar, um, but uh, one of them uh, offered, the first one, uh, Homestyle, offers up to 75% of the loan can be used for rehabilitation, uh, which is a pretty aggressive thing there. Uh, however, it has very high uh, credit standards, about 680 credit score. Um, and then uh, for the second product, uh, this, this one, uh, home ready is targeted more towards low income borrowers. Uh, so the credit requirements are lower at about 620. Um, however, you have to either live in a, what the federal government sees as basically a poor neighborhood, so about half of Oakland, 
or you have to, or if you're going to live in a nicer neighborhood, you have to have an income of area median income. And if you want to live above Highway 580 in Oakland, it's hard to buy a house if your annual income is only $100,000 a year, which is crazy, but still uh, how the case is. On the brighter note, however, there's a couple of other federal things here, uh, which are uh, the Community Development Block Grants, uh, which is uh, exactly that, a block grant. The government says, here's a chunk of money. Uh, there's some limitations of what you can spend it on, um, but you can otherwise spend it on pretty much anything. Um, and the city of Oakland does use this. So uh, there's a major crowd out issue in that they're already spending this money on vitally needed housing and homelessness related services. So it's perhaps not a good candidate. But the federal government said, look, we want to make it so you can leverage these grant allocations. So what we'll do is we will lend you money based on your community development block grant allocation. Um, and you can use that, take that money, and then spend it on anything you could spend a community development block grant on. And you can pay us off, and it has a low interest rate. And we know you're going to pay us back because worst comes to worst, we can always just sequester your future community development block grant allocation, uh, which is a very clever idea. Um, and the good news is that Oakland has $29 million of borrowing capacity through this low uh, interest federal loan program, and they could take some of this money, borrow it from the federal government, and then turn around and then lend it out to uh, other parties, uh, whether that's a developer or even individual homeowners. Um, so the city would have to pledge collateral in case the thing fell through, so there's a little bit of risk attached to that. Uh, but the good news is that um, ADU construction would be an eligible use for this, so long as it fits within the fabric of an existing home, if it's on the original foundation. So you can't use backyard ADUs with this, but if you want to do a basement ADU or a garage ADU, then this would be certainly an option. So if Oakland was interested in operating its own loan program, this would be a really great way for them to get some startup funding, potentially. Uh, so those are some of the main federal options. Now let's look at the uh, state and county options. I called the state uh, housing and community development office. I talked to them about grant opportunities. Uh, they said that they were very passionate about promoting accessory dwelling units, but they did not have any funding available for that purpose. Um, so uh, maybe the, they're working on it. Um, uh, good news is that uh, voters of Alameda County, in their wisdom, recently approved an affordable housing bond measure. Um, primarily dedicated for uh, you know, typical affordable housing construction with allocations specific to city, but there was a $35 million set aside for an innovation fund, which would enable you to um, try to invest in relatively new and unconventional and opportunistic affordable housing supply opportunities. And ADUs seems to be a prime candidate for that kind of thing. And I believe they were already did taking at least a little bit of interest in that. Um, so potentially this is a source of funds that Oakland could pursue uh, to uh, help capitalize an ADU loan fund without crowding out other kind of affordable housing development in Oakland. Um, and with $35 million, that's a substantial amount of money. And then of course the benefit is that because this is a county uh, affordable housing bond measure, you don't have the same kind of restrictions about inside outside that we were looking at for the federal funds. So uh, now let's take a brief look at city options because of course, if Oakland wants to build more ADUs, it can always spend its own money. Uh, the problem is the city of Oakland does not have a whole lot of money to spend, uh, as we were getting at earlier. They've got uh, over a billion dollars in unfunded long-term liabilities that they don't have a plan to pay off. Um, and uh, the amount of money that's in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is quite limited. Um, and also, it's heavily leveraged in that often this is the first place an affordable housing developer will go. They take it and they get use the city commitment to leverage commitments from the state and from the federal government. So there would be a significant crowd out problem if we wanted to try to fund ADUs using the Affordable Housing Trust Fund because uh, it is so linked to other kind of funding opportunities uh, for conventional multifamily affordable housing development. Um, so there's also some more um, uh, options that we were looking at uh, for the uh, more experimental side of things. Um, one thing that I was interested in is real estate crowdfunding, and don't worry, I'm not proposing that Oakland go to Kickstarter and try to fund ADUs that way. Uh, there have been a number of websites started in the past five to 10 years uh, which take uh, either institutional investors or wealthy private investors, and they match them rather more directly with real estate investment opportunities. Uh, there's a number of them, and uh, to, cumulatively they've capitalized uh, over a billion dollars in real estate investment so far. Um, so they are a wide variety of kinds of things, everything from student housing to house flipping to skyscrapers uh, for commercial offices. 
So, uh, uh, so I wasn't able to find a particularly perfect match. However, uh, this is an interesting area. If the city wants to try and bypass the banks and still tap private investment, this could be an opportunity. They do tend to ask for higher rates of return than you would find in most banking products because this is an investment product. Um, however, uh, this is uh, a very diverse landscape. And also, I checked the rules. It's actually surprisingly easy to create one of these. Uh, so uh, the city of Oakland, possibly in tandem with other barrier governments, might even be able to start its own crowdfunding site if it wanted to go directly to investors and ask them to invest in this kind of thing. Uh, another couple of uh, related things uh, in terms of experimental ideas uh, are the idea of accessory dwelling units as a service, where basically uh, you rent an ADU from a developer, and they take a prefabricated ADU, they drop it in your backyard, and uh, you rent it from them. And either you can move in your grandma, or your uh, recent college graduate, um, or you can... Uh, <laughs> imagine, or imagine a college graduate. <laughs> yeah, or... Uh, or... <laughs> Uh, or you can, uh, or you can rent it out, and then you you pay the the the, the ADU as a service company a monthly fee, basically. And at a certain point, if you don't want it anymore, they pick it up and they move it on to the next site. Um, now that's basically mostly on the drawing board at this point. This isn't something that's happening yet. However, this is something that folks I talked to think is a promising idea uh, that may develop uh, in the near future. And something that we've been seeing a little bit more down the pipeline. Uh, is the idea of, somewhat similarly, land leases, where, um, for example, an example I saw in Los Angeles, um, there was a company that basically will rent your garage for 25 years, um, and then they convert it into an ADU, and they give you a cut of the profits, basically. Um, so uh, they do all the construction, they bear the risk financially, uh, and you don't have to secure a farm themselves, they secure the financing. Um, so there are some examples in this sphere, uh, and land leases is something that is a little bit less unconventional uh, for when it comes to property law, but um, it's unclear how we would be able to capitalize something similar up in Oakland necessarily. So apparently the Southern California operation was able to secure financing to do its business, but uh, scalability might be an issue here. Um, so uh, the three top options uh, I'm recommending to Oakland uh, if, you're, if Oakland's interested in creating its own loan program directly to homeowners uh, to help with ADU construction, uh, ca you could probably capitalize it using the Section 108 loan program based on the community development block grants, uh, or it could use um, the county uh, bond measure uh, with the Innovation Fund, another uh, significant source of funding that's available there. Uh, so mixing these federal and local funds. Uh, if the city of Oakland does not want to get directly involved in lending to homeowners to create uh, accessory dwelling units, uh, then it might be able to serve as a matchmaker in terms of trying to help facilitate uh, a similar operation to the one in Southern California coming to Oakland and then doing running private business, which will go to homeowners and say, hey, look, if you're not using that garage, you can get income, we'll handle everything. Um, so uh, those are the sort of the public and private options there. Um, so uh, accessory dwelling units uh, financing is tricky. Um, I mean, we have the Dodd-Frank rules. Uh, we don't have existing ADU dedicated products because the securitization markets simply aren't ready for them yet. Um, however, by creatively using local, uh, county, uh, and federal funding, uh, possibly with private investment, there are opportunities for Oakland to substantially increase the levels of accessory dwelling units uh, within its city, which would uh, be a, a much needed source of new affordable housing. Um, so. Uh, there is uh, no cookie cutter solution. I mean, other cities have tried. Portland nearly did a basement ADU loan program. It did not happen because they couldn't get on the same page about what they wanted. Los Angeles is trying to do something similar. Um, they are only doing two to three units in their pilot program, so they're going to be the two to three most highly vetted ADUs in the history of ADUs, most likely, because uh, they had, I think, hundreds of applicants to be the two to three ADUs. Um, and, uh, uh, we see that Oakland would have the opportunity to lead the nation in many respects here uh, when it comes to trying to develop this source of affordable housing. So uh, those are uh, the main points here, and I'm ready to take any questions you might have. Thank you once again for coming here today. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. so it just you didn't really mention the size of the market and how many people, how many you think will be 
you kind of said here's how many were in 2017, but <coughs> how big a project, you know, possibility is this, and how much would it, what would it, what would it do to affordability at all? That was the question. Sure. <laughs> sure. Come with another one. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, solving an affordability crisis is definitely one of these death by a thousand cuts yeah. kind of situations. So 80s is not going to get you there alone as much as 80s rock. Um, so in terms of the prospects, there are thousands of potential sites uh, that might work from a peer viability point of view. Uh, what we uh, we also see that from survey data in San, uh, San Mateo County. Uh, that a relatively high proportion of homeowners, over a third, uh, were willing to entertain the idea of putting in an accessory dwelling unit in their house. So uh, there might need to be a public information component paired with this, but based on the existing data we have on interest, the possibility of sites, and if we can also get the financing lined up to make it all nice and easy, then uh, there seems to easily be a perspective for maybe uh, several hundred units a year uh, being added. And how many more would be added because of finance? What's the, 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 the constraint? How much does the financing constraint cause that number to be lower? Sure. Um, it's a little bit unclear at this point exactly uh, what that level is. Um, I mean, uh, uh, we don't have that kind of detailed survey information available yet because this is such an emerging thing. I mean, they relaxed the permitting rules just a couple of years ago. Um, they seem to be a significant concern um, talking to the folks in the mayor's office. That's something that they uh, were seeing as a key priority. Um, so uh, when we see that there's homeowner interest and thousands of potential sites, that if you look at why is this happening, uh, and there has been media coverage of this before, then by process of elimination, you start to arrive more at the financing options because we have the information, we have the interest, we have the physical viability. Financing is sort of the remainder of the uh, problem set, as it were. There's also a reluctance um, for agents turning into Airbnbs, right? So a lot of cities are resentful of the idea that you'll bring more housing online, but it won't truly use the affordability for them. Sure, yeah, that's definitely a concern. Um, the availability, uh, available information I've seen suggests that a very small proportion of ADUs are used uh, for those purposes. Um, I think 15%, something like that, so a very small proportion. Um, uh, when you think about how many ADUs we're talking about. And then also, uh, Oakland has rules that prohibit short-term rentals officially, so um, uh, those would be illegal under current city law. Oakland's looking at reforming that. Uh, but if paired with a robust code enforcement uh, provision, then uh, Oakland would potentially be able to crack down on those kinds of illegal uses. San Francisco has a, a huge uh, illegal accessory apartment problem. In other words, these, these units have been under the table for years and years. You can walk down many streets in San Francisco, particularly on the west side, and you'll see a garage door, and then you'll see a mail slot in the garage door, which is <laughs> always a giveaway, and sometimes a bell. Does, does, uh, did, you, did you get much of a sense that Oakland has a similar problem? In other words, there are units already out there, but they're outlawed yeah. units, and no one knows about them. They're not registered. Yeah, and it, even as illegal units, they're catering to the to the housing demand. Mm -hmm. So, did you did you get much of a sense of that? Though? Yeah, um, I don't think that there's currently a citywide estimate for the number of illegal units in Oakland. I mean, there definitely are some. Uh, I believe it's less of a problem in Oakland than in San Francisco because uh, yeah, it's been fairly recently that there's been massive housing demand in Oakland, so um, it was perhaps more attractive for people to make those illegal conversions in San Francisco than Oakland. But uh, it used to be quite affordable to buy a house in most of Oakland, so it wouldn't necessarily be uh, useful or economical to uh, make those kinds of illegal conversions at the same scale as in San Francisco. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Do you think, does Prop 13 deter homeowners from wanting to build these ADUs? Does it increase their assessment overall? Sure, or sure. Or feel like if it's a garage, I mean, it's already... Yeah. Developed. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, something similar was the reason why Portland was uh, unable to move forward with its project. Um, however, from my understanding of what I read up, it sounds like uh, building an ADU uh, will not trigger a reassessment of your house. Um, so uh, it would cause the house to potentially be worth more when you sell it, which would lead to a higher assessed valuation for future homeowners. Um, however, I don't think it triggers a reassessment, so I don't believe it would have any negative implications on your property tax bill unless your assessment was um, artificially reduced because of uh, you bought it at, say, right before the housing crisis and still hasn't recovered to the pre-crisis housing uh, values. That would be the only case in which you would have negative property tax implications. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, sir. Let me ask the question that I wanted to ask at the beginning. You put up the table on construction costs. Yes, sir. Uh, I can go back to that if you like. Yeah. The, uh, I presume that ADUs uh, have no land costs involved in the sense that they've been built on a ready purchased property. Mm -hmm. To what extent is the new affordable apartment estimate that cost? Does that include the cost of acquisition of land? Yes. Um, Let's see. Um, let me just cast my mind back to a moment. Um, I think that that was an all-inclusive cost, if I remember correctly. Um, I think so, because otherwise I, I'm at a loss to explain the yeah. very substantial difference. Yeah. If you're building a lot of units, if it's a compartment model, for example. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think land cost is definitely a part of it. Uh, there are, I think, some construction savings sometimes when you build an ADU in, say, a basement or something like that, because uh, you're able to save a little bit by sharing the utility connection. Sometimes there's existing uh, utilities that you can use, uh, insulation, that kind of thing. Um, however, that varies very much situation by situation. So land cost is a very likely a, a driving factor there. Thank you. Uh, Carol, did you have a chance to investigate the uh, California State Housing Finance Agency? I, mean, I think they do uh -huh. mostly private home loans, but, yes. but I'm not exactly sure whether this is something they might Yes, I, I did take a look at what they were up to. I, I, yeah, similarly, it seems that they're primarily geared towards private uh, finance at this point. I tried to contact them just to double check, but they didn't get back to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, I think that they, they did recently, uh, for their loan program for first-time loan to borrowers, I think they relaxed it so you can buy a home that already has an ADU in it, mm -hmm. uh, which was, I think, a change that they were celebrating a year or two ago. But I don't think that they have any particular loan programs uh, specifically designed to help support the construction of ADUs mm -hmm. as part of the purpose of buying a house. And even if they were, because they're primarily working through private lenders, it seems like that would probably be pretty similar to the Fannie Mae offerings that already exist in this yeah. area. Yeah. yeah, that's a good thought. Yeah. Yeah, it, w it would be, let's face it, if you're a young homeowner or a home buyer, you purchase a home and you have the opportunity to include an ADU and generate an income stream to help you carry the mortgage, it would be tremendous. And, you know, going back generations, the old Massachusetts triple-decker houses, yeah. you know, the, the working-class guy who bought a triple-decker house occupied the first floor, put grandma and grandpa on the second floor and rented out the third floor and the rent from the third floor pretty much covered the mortgage and it's a, it's a tried and true sort of technique that goes back generations you know and uh, you might even be opening a inadvertently opening a door here to uh, a way of increasing home ownership for young young families who might otherwise not have the income stream sure absolutely yeah definitely uh as, yeah, and also for a lot of uh, existing homeowners who are perhaps struggling financially, this would be a much needed stream of new income. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, let's go back to the three that you came up with. You sort of went really fast. Uh -huh. uh, so, first question is, is the goal just to increase the total number of units, or do you have a strategy that puts each one of these options towards a particular segment of the housing market that you would want to. So in other words, if you're going to market this, if one of the problems that these pro 